So welcome, Dr. Chris Kerr. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Um, as I told Dr. Kerr, I feel like his TED Talk is just one that I come back to again and again. And in this part one of our conversation, we're going to be talking about you know, how we kind of came to his research, what the research is, and how that has led to something so much bigger. TED Talk, book, documentary, film, um, such amazing, amazing pieces. So how, you know, how would you summarize for listeners kind of what research you got into? Yeah, it's, um, it, 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 in a way, it was spurred by my journey to hospice. So I, I never sought out to do this work. In fact, I petitioned to get out of the rotation in hospice as a resident. And uh, in 1999, I was just looking to moonlight when I was a cardiology fellow, I ended up at hospice. And um, I wasn't here very long. And, uh, you know, I had to reconcile the fact that I wasn't prepared to know much about death, let alone the process of dying, let alone the patient's experience in it. And it was really my colleagues in other areas, non-medical, who um, forced me to, to closer to the bedside and to acknowledge and at least recognize that patients were having these inner experiences, which are not surprising given that dying actually, you know, of course does change your vantage point and your perception. And, um, and um, uh, with that, I, I, I just started, it was undeniable as much as I, I, I tried to turn away that patients were having um, these profound events. And that um, the point I got to was that I was less concerned with the why or, did, or how or dismissing or diagnosing and just respecting the fact or d developing a reverence for the fact that these were, the dying was much more of a human experience than a medical paradigm to solve. And that regardless of what was happening, is they were profoundly real to the patient. And as importantly, they were deeply therapeutic and not just for them, but the ones they loved. And I love the, the book is titled, the book is called Death is But a Dream. But you really, in the book, go on to say, these aren't really dreams. These are really, you call them end of life experiences. Things that yeah. people have happened to them that are kind of unexplainable by well, the, 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 Yeah, and, and I actually um, uh, resisted the idea of that title and, and still do, because if we're to listen to our patients, they're going out of their way to tell us they're not dreams. So we don't have another nomenclature and reference point, so that's what we use. But the statements we most commonly hear is, no, you don't understand, I don't normally dream, or these were wasn't like a dream. And um, when we measured realism in our studies, it was 10 out of 10. So these feel more virtual um, and they're, 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 they don't go to places where they're working out, you know, Freudian conflicts or deep laden meanings, and they're not asking for interpretation. So these are very different than dreams in a lot of ways. But so what happened is I, ca I came to this recognition that these were obviously significant and, and, and we should have reverence for them. And then I was trying to teach um, medical students and residents. Of course, we live in an evidence-based time and they would say there's no evidence. Of course, there's an abundance of evidence, but it's largely in the humanities, um, in religion. It's always been talked about throughout time and cultures across the world. Um, the evidence we had on the medical side of the equation tended to be more case studies or anecdotal reportings. And they didn't control for enough variables like, is this patient confused? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was we started our first study and it's kind of funny, the study sat on a table, the design for probably 10 years. I thought nobody would be interested in it until a young fellow said, you're crazy, this is really interesting. So we proceeded with the study and were shocked because it, 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 it received essentially zero responses from the medical community but then it started to go around the world. You ended up in the front of the New York Times, um, ended up in India, China, you name it, and it spread. And, and, and it, that says several things. One, there's this clear gap between how the regard for these experiences from the providers of care on the clinical medical side versus the recipient or those who are caring for the dying, what they're actually experiencing. Um, so there was this, there's this need to put 
the, to validate these phenomena, but put it in a caregiving context or framework that at least gave it meaning or regard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best part of the story. What propelled this work forward was not that our research was not elaborate or, you know, we, we're basically telling what's already been told. We just put a different frame on it. But what it did is it gave uh, momentum and energy and most importantly, validation to people who were having these events. For, for like for a listener who, who is like, wait, wait, what, what is Dr. Kerr talking about? Like, can you give a, an example of, of one, of, you know, one of your favorite patients and kind of the experiences that they were having? Oh gosh. Um, they run the gamut. Um, so the, the, the vast majority of these are comforting, you know, um, 85 plus percent are highly comforting. And basically what happens is people near death, the frequency of these events increases. And what happens is you start to see more of the deceased who you loved, who are, and who, who return to you. And when we measure comfort, seeing the deceased associated was with the highest comfort. So there's this built in mechanism where you're soothed as you're approaching death. Um, and we actually looked at post-traumatic growth as a phenomenon. So people are actually growing, gaining insight. And it's almost like they're being reconnected and put back together with the best parts of having lived. Um, in terms of the most profound, you know, mothers who had lost children. Um, and a common phenomena is that time and distance seem to be irrelevant. So that it feels as though they were never gone. And what their re-experience is, the love that they once had known, um, that in life had left them, um, but was returned to them. Um, some of the most moving uh, that I have witnessed are actually uncomfortable dreams. But that, because these don't deny having lived, which includes being wounded, um, but that brought certain closure or awareness that was transformational. Um, so, and this is on the documentary of a fellow who was a drug addict and spent most of his life in prison. And he had had neck cancer and his experience was he was being stabbed at the site of his neck. Um, and he unfolds actually on camera because he was always jovial, but he, he starts telling the story. He started to weep uncontrollably. But what that did was that led to him to do an honest assessment and he reaches out to a daughter who had, had, had lost touch of a bit and just say how much he loved her and that he was sorry. And then he slept after that. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're all, it's such a privilege to be a part uh, of this sort of thing. You really, you talk about, um, in the book, you talk about this beautiful list. You kind of say, you know, these end of life experiences are not just easing the dying process, but they also address a life in its entirety. And that's what you're talking about here. And, and sometimes people have a sense of being forgiven or guided or reassured or simply loved. And, um, you know, I, I think that's so powerful to think that these experiences can come when we're, we're facing death. And I found it fascinating that some, many of your patients know they are facing death, but even in the experience of one patient who was very much in denial and did not want to be dying and would not admit there was death imminent, she had had these kind of end of life experiences where I believe it was her grandfather was visiting her. Yeah. And so even when we consciously are pushing it away, there is this, um, not always a neat, clean resolution, but kind of a going back over, a coming to terms with what we've experienced. Yeah, and there's almost this fascinating editing process too, where the people who conditioned or withheld or compromised love or hurt us are kind of kept out. And those that secured us best are, are pulled back in. But yeah, it, it becomes highly predictive. So we had a um, woman, she's also in the film, who taught, she had lost a daughter and a husband. She's around the kitchen table with them. And, um, and she's just enjoying the, the warmth of that familiarity uh, that had been lost. And, um, but she looked really good and helped. And she had sudden death three or four days later. So yeah, you, you, you don't know. It's very interesting. These, clearly these end of life experiences do self-inform. And we see that with children. Um, where everybody's contorted on how to um, 
communicate impending death to a child who may not have a sense of mortality or permanence. And yet they start dreaming in ways that um, tells them they're loved and loved and, and not alone, like a, rec a return of a pet and um, who's deceased. And somehow there's enough almost data points put together that they, that they get the gestalt. And, um, and it's, all, it's, it's in our experience, in our cases, we publish some of these cases that, you know, the, the, they tell the patient and, the, and the, the child is often then becomes a messenger of reassurance to the parents. You know, I'm okay. And there's a wonderful you know, young lady in the film, Ginny, who builds a whole castle around. She says, it's my, this is where I'm gonna, it's safe. Yeah. Um, and she all the deceased kids return. She can convey it to her parents and there's a sense of calm. Well, she gave all this tactile uh, interpretive pieces to us, so warm sunlight coming through. Um, the, the animals that were injured are now back to life and playful. And so, yeah, she, break, she put energy and life back together for herself while saying goodbye. While saying goodbye, that there's this opportunity. And, and I think, I do think it's fascinating that there isn't really a level of interpretation that people are looking for. They, they, it's not about interpretation. It's about almost an integration or um, an experiential understanding of what they've gone through in their lifetime that comes back. Yeah, I've been doing this 22 years. And I got to tell you, I've never had a patient say to me, um, what do you think it means? Um, and I think that's great because in, in practical sense, the time for therapy is over, right? And that struggle um, to put together and to, and to dissect uh, and amalgamate it, it isn't necessary. Instead, you're given a feeling of something. You're not given a puzzle. Um, you, you're, you're given the answer, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's fascinating that you started your research thinking, you know, oh, this will be so powerful for doctors and nurses. And then again, it was the families that were most impact, impacted. Um, and say a little about that, because you, you talk about how it's not just the patients who are impacted by that, and you just spoke of it with this child, but also the bereaved are impacted by these experiences. Yeah, you know, it, it kind of makes sense. So how people leave us matters. It informs us, it tells us how we remember them. Um, it allows us to grieve very differently if, if uh, depending on how we view that, 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 that loss. And in the case of a lost child to a parent, if that person's life partner is with them, they're viewing that person leaving, it's actually life affirming, not life denying. And we actually measured, you know, we've had, I think, Seven eight hundred surveys of bereaved people in two separate studies, and we looked at bereavement scales and how people process loss, and they do it very differently. These they're witness to these experience, which also speaks to the need for the clinician to help not um, not ex ex at least translate that these events are normal um, rather than manifestations of a diseased brain. Because if viewed in the right context, then um, there are enormous gifts um, to those left behind. Um, and we were able to actually measure that, which is interesting. Really interesting, really interesting. Along these lines, you say in the book, pre-death dreams and visions assist loved ones in their journey toward acceptance and that this is the key to processing loss. When the dying patient becomes absorbed in and then comforted by their end of life experiences, it changes the context of dying from loneliness to a life affirming connection. And this is as significant for the bereaved as it is for the dying. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it's so funny that that had to come out of a research paradigm, because if you look to other cultures, I, I'm in touch now with this filmmaker is doing this in Australia is doing this very very interesting work with indigenous people in Australia and South America. And it's inherent to their belief systems and it's critical in that it's their ties to their ancestors. You know, so they, they mourn death, they don't fear death um, because it's their means uh, of, they're, they're, they're never broken from the chain. Yes. And um, so I had to put that in a study in front, but, but that's a given in, a lot of cultures in this world. Um, 
So right, you know. very interesting. And you had to sort of study it to legitimize it. I was just telling a friend this morning that I, I was going to be interviewing you and kind of what your book and movie were about and so on. And and um, he described something that had happened with his grandmother, and he said, "Yeah, it was kind of bizarre." And I said, "Well, that's just it, though. It's not bizarre. It's really actually common." But because we yeah. don't talk about it, we we don't quite know where to put it. Um, right. Yeah. Well, and that's been the fuel for this work all the time because people, it, it's it's like a weird Rorschach test. And people want to share their interpretation or what their experience to bear on it is. And it's, it's fascinating. It is. It's fascinating. How many patients have you worked with in this, in this kind of context? Well, I think research? we're almost at 1,600 in total total patients and families together. Oh, yeah. 1600 and mostly through. And those are all, those are, those are all informal studies, right? Uh -huh. And then there's obviously all the informal ones. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I just think it's such an interesting line of work. Have you found, have other researchers come on board and become interested in this? Um, you know, we, we, we've seen pockets of it uh, appear. It's been nice to see it done in India, some done in China. So just to show the cross-cultural aspects of it. Um, not a lot, not a lot has been done here per se in terms of replicating. It's very, uh, 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 well, probably the biggest accomplishment was getting this through a review board of a university because we have this, we have this unusual and inhumane habit of kind of sterilizing the dying process and putting them on the shelf to be quiet and not to be disturbed. So the fact we got it through, um, an IRB. So that, that that's yeah. an obstacle for a lot of places. Yeah. And not yeah. many hospices have a research department. So we're extremely fortunate. Right. The kind of scope that you have, that you can have that many patients come through your doors in a way that you can somewhat consistently yeah. create interviews and so on. Yeah. Are there are there other offshoots of this kind of research that you'd like to see happen? Are there other questions that stir in your research mind? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there's great questions. Some we, we've, we've worked on, um, which is, you know, more detail about the dynamics of what people are, are experiencing. I think the whole area of, of pediatrics is interesting. I actually, the biggest undisclosed need, I think, is people who are cognitively different. And um, that's actually my favorite part of the book. Um, because unfortunately, those folks are rarely included in formal studies because of the uh, thresholds for participation, right? Right. Um, yet, what we we measure, particularly to people with dementia, in terms of their cognitive deficits, with and we disregard their emotional lives, which are often rich and ongoing, and particularly in the case of dementia, they're awfully well rooted in the distant past. So they remember what they wore to their high school prom, but they may not know what they had for breakfast that morning. Um, they they have end of life experiences that uh, are powerful. And in fact, it's an interesting area that I'm always fascinated with. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of terminal lucidity. Um, where all of a sudden that person who has limited recall it is able to to, to verbalize and, and gain memory prowess they didn't have. And I've often wondered, is it because what they're doing is they're kindling a lot of recall through their dream experiences or, or end of life experiences? Because we see we see it all the time. People have demented folks have end of life experiences. And is that kindling memory that they have now have access to, just like music, for example, yeah. can bring make a an otherwise nonverbal advanced dementia patient become verbal or vocal? And um, so this idea of rekindling oneself, um, which is a very interesting way to look at dying as a process, because instead of lessening or diminishing, you're actually expanding and growing and living, and Again, it goes back to the central premise that when you stop viewing dying in terms of parts failing, organs not working, and look at it in totality, which is, which is a life closing rather than a body failing, it becomes a very, very, very different phenomena. And yes, there's lost history, but there, 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 there absolutely needs to be respect for something that's bigger.
So I love that. That's so powerful. I think that's at the heart of what my work is trying to do, which is create conversations that um, that at the bottom line be with that um, closure of a life. Yeah. Which is very different than. Um, well, the, and what's so important in that in the work you're doing, you reference duos is the first um, critical rate limiting step is being present. Yes. Yes. So, you know, it's not a doctor flying by to listen to somebody's heart and lungs. It's actually right. And it's not a mindset of fixing. It's a mindset of being with and witnessing. And then I think your work just expands what is possible to be witnessed at those times. Mm -hmm. Well, this seems like a good place to pause for part one. And um, when we come back for part two, Dr. Kerr and I want to talk more about um, hospice and his work and all he's seen in his many, many years, um, hospice and palliative care of Buffalo, how they're a model for um, what's possible. So thanks for part one. Thank you.